Spencer, uh, it's great to have you here. I want to talk about your books, but before we go there, I have kind of a, a personal uh, question I want to I want to ask you about. Um, yeah. Now, your your father, uh, Andrew Claven, is a brilliant, one of the best known American novelists, especially in, of course, mystery, uh, mystery and crime stories. I happen to think that his uh, podcast is the best one out there. I admire that show very much. And actually, that's how I was introduced to you. Um, and one of the great things about your collaboration with your father, and this is what I want to ask you about as a father myself, because I have a 20 year old son, um, you and your father have a very uh, beautiful and sophisticated relationship. And uh, frankly, I envy it very much. And so I'm interested to know how you and, uh, and, and your father have been able to sort of work out and sort of transcend this sort of chasm between father son but you still have retained that father and son relationship but it's obviously you're very close but there's a mutual respect how how were you and your father able to able to achieve that it really is a wonderful thing to to experience oh well thank you and it's one of the chief joys of my life so it's actually a great blessing i always start here by saying that we're very lucky my dad and i in in that i think all fathers and sons naturally tend to love each other or to care very deeply for each other. Of course, there are tragic situations in which that relationship can be broken, but there's a, a natural, even I would almost call it an animal bond, not in a pejorative way, just that this is right. a, 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 an affection that grows automatically out of biological relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you indicate, we're also friends and one is lucky in one's life if one has a few very, very close friends. And if, if one of those very close friends happens to be your father, then you've really won the lottery because it's mm -hmm. like layering over an, another relationship, another kind of love onto that original familial love. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say that although we, we have not had a turbulent relationship, that, that the, the transition from father-son to friendship was a dynamic one that it, it, it mostly had to do with my own growing into maturity. And I think every father-son pairing has the painful experience of realizing that in order to grow, you have to break away. And that's painful for, for both the parent and the child. You know, you become your own person, your own man. And that did happen to me sort of as I went through my teenage years. Um, and, and so I guess my advice, if I have any, to fathers and sons that are in this kind of journey, trying to learn how to relate to one another as adults, I would, I would say, you know, that for the father, it's probably a, a process of letting go, that this is about coming to understand that this person you've known as dependent on you is going to now strike out on his own. You know, the Bible speaks of children as arrows in a quiver. And mm -hmm. often it's taken, this is taken to mean as mean that, you know, your your children are your wealth or your children are are part of your kind of arsenal and all of that can be true. But there's a reason that it doesn't the Bible doesn't speak of children as swords in in your hand because your children have a trajectory and arrows fly away from you. It, and that's proper <laughs> and, and right. So you have to kind of learn on both sides to to handle that and accept that and then turn back toward one another. And on the son's part, I think there's a, an important lesson to be learned, which is that you, you are independent now, which mm -hmm. means that you are free. And whereas previously you were kind of obligated to your father, now it's up to you to freely choose to love and honor your mm -hmm. father, which is which is man's estate to be able to make those free choices. And so mm -hmm. just like the freedom that God gives us to live our lives as we choose, there's a purpose to that freedom, which is to choose the good. It's it, You will actually be destroyed by going off in, in sort of on, on dark paths. And, and God is not sort of, scolding you or trying to ruin your fun by by teaching you about virtue he's inviting you into the dance of of love of freely chosen love and this is mm -hmm. the same with with fathers and sons i think so it's yeah. you know it's it's a process that you have to learn to kind of accept step by step but it's obviously yeah. also the stuff of life yeah but what well, sounds like that relationship and your approach to it uh and also your your father's you know andrew clavin no relation 
um, is is this faith, uh, and uh, that faith is also present uh, in your writing. Um, your your books, uh, you know, just we don't know each other, but just so you know, I'm a lawyer by trade, but. My, my undergraduate degree was in, I did an honors thesis in Shakespeare. And I, I read probably two to three books a week. And wow. your two books are probably the most beautifully written prose I've seen in a long time. And you you really treat beautifully in your most recent book, this concept of um, the, the tension between science and religion. And this is not an easy topic, as you know. And and uh, but uh, I was reminded of a quotation here from uh, Georges Lemaitre, who said, "There's no conflict between science and religion." And perhaps we could start there because I think maybe that's uh, that seems to be one of the main themes in your book. That's different from some of the other books written on this topic. Is you don't seem to see science and religion at war. In fact, you see them as sort of moving in harmony. Uh, do I have this right? Uh, t- tell me what you think about this in terms of, uh, you know, your how how you framed your second book. Oh well, thank you first of all, and I think that you're onto something, which has to do, interestingly, with my particular place in my my particular age and and the time in which I grew up, and the fact that I am part of kind of an an up and coming generation, as you mentioned. And I think the purpose of this new book, Light of the Mind, which what is what really makes it distinctive in this field is that I really start out by announcing this attitude is out of date. Um, this is an attitude that once seemed very prevalent, but now can be kind of swept away. And it can be swept away both from a scientific perspective, because Science itself is now moving in a direction that seems to need a a spiritual or religious outlook to make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But also it can be swept away from a religious perspective because those of us that believe don't have anything to fear from science. Um, And I think that, yeah, getting a handle on that, taking stock of that and really realizing that that is where we're starting now is, is a step down a new road that those of us that grew up with this idea of of the war between science and religion, it might seem a bit strange at first. You know, the subtitle of the book is Illuminating Science Through Faith, which would have sounded very provocative 10 years ago. But now that the new atheism has kind of passed away, um, a lot of people are starting to realize that you need some kind of supernatural or transcendent or metaphysical way of looking at the world to make sense of it. Um, And so I think that, yeah, it is absolutely perhaps the quality of the writing that you're describing arises out of that um, delight that this is actually nothing to fear here, that we actually have new discoveries to make about what we already know um, that that can now be incorporated into a more confident vision of the world that that includes science and faith and endorses Mm -hmm. them both. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really appreciate about this book is um, you really don't skimp on the science. It's obvious that you spend a lot of time, even though you're a, you're trained as a classicist and obviously have a deep understanding of of literature, you spend a lot of time getting into the guts of science and really studying uh, the, not only the history of science, but the new science, uh, how it ties into threads like atheism. Um, What was that process like in researching that part of the book? Because um, it seems to me, I don't know if you have a scientific background, but it doesn't seem that you do. Was that Mm. was that a challenge or was that an exciting thing for you to go off and and do that research in sort of, quote unquote, hard science and dealing with some of the writings of people like uh, like Dr. Meyer? Yeah, well, it was both, I would say it was daunting and it was also exciting. I don't have a background beyond the college level in the sciences. I my graduate work, as you indicate, was all in in literature. Mm-hmm. But we are really entering into an age. I've been calling it the age of the generalist. We're we're really entering into an age where we need to be talking to one another, and those of us who specialize in one field need to take other fields seriously. And it's it's urgent because if if Christians and scholars of literature abandon these fields to people who are totally uninterested in 
this matters of, of spiritual import, um, then we will be putting ourselves at this enormous disadvantage that other, essentially atheists are the only ones who know about the physical world. Um, and I don't really think that's necessary at all. I think, I hope this book is very readable. I hope it's it engaging. Is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, obviously it's working. Um, I want to talk about your first book, How to Save the West, Ancient mm -hmm. Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. And for those, if you've not read this yet, I experienced this first as an audio book before I bought the hardcover. And, and uh, uh, you did a brilliant job of narration. Obviously, you have a splendid voice for narration. Um, but this book um, I found fascinating. It's more of a of a philosophy book, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, although that maybe understates the case. But I but I almost read read this one when I read the second one, um, not not in sort of, in sort of a, a you know a sequel. The second one being a sequel, but they do sort of fit together, don't they? It, was that by design or is that just how it worked out? Because the first book is really uh, talking about um, you know. Uh, it's described here as a book to let you know you're not alone. The wisdom of the ages can guide us through the struggles of the present. The fate of our civilization of our civilization depends on whether ordinary people internalize the truth and beauty conveyed in the masterpieces of Western culture. And I really see a lot of the things that you talk about in that book, like the crisis of reality, the crisis of the body, the crisis of meaning, crisis of religion, all these things really in a lot of ways are further explicated in your second book. Was that, do you agree with that first of all? And was that by design? Yes, Vita, that's very astute. I think you're the second person to notice this. So it, it, it's interesting because I've been talking about this book obviously a fair bit uh, since it came out last week. And um, to me, this is almost a sequel to How to Save the West, which is funny to say because they don't bear any immediately obvious relationship. And it's not as if I set out to write two books that would follow one after the other. It's more that every book is also a thought process. And if it's, right. uh, if you're doing your job right, you're also learning things and you're discovering things and you will usually end up, and this has been true also of the, of the second book, you will usually end up feeling as if there's a whole other unwritten book contained in the book that you just wrote. And so what happened with How to Save the West is that I, I outline that book in terms of five crises that I think we are facing. And I sort of walked through, I outlined it in advance, the five things that I think we're struggling with in, in the West at, at a deep philosophical level. So, so they are reality, our relationship to our bodies, um, meaning, religion, and, and politics. And, and those are the five crises. But as I began to work them out, it became really clear to me that they're each linked to one another and that all of them lead up to the crisis of religion, that right. ultimately behind each of them, there is a, a problem that we're facing about whether we can believe in anything absolute beyond the material world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was for that reason that, you know, in the the crisis of religion section, I ended up talking about the multiverse and, and dealing with all these sort of scientific issues that I did not expect to be dealing with. Um, and when a book surprises you, that's the best thing. That's when you're really on to something exciting. Um, and I thought, you know, this is really the obstacle. This is, this is what's keeping us from biting the bullet is our sense, not our intellectual idea, but more our superstition or our ambient fear that on the other side of the leap of faith, there is irrationality and a kind of anti-science outlook. And right. so, yes, that that this book came right out of that feeling and, and, and right out of an attempt to address what I think is kind of the core crisis and, and remove one of the major burdens that seems to be keeping people back from uh, a healthy outlook on religion and so much else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.